Well, I have some remarks I want to share with you today, so I hope you're all sitting comfortably. In light of mass protests taking place in the United States and worldwide, it may seem strange that I haven't ditched the topic of today's worship service, the power of play. I hope that in the following remarks, it will eventually become clear why I've decided to persist in hewing to this theme. So hang in there with me. 30 years ago, Canada joined with 196 countries in ratifying the legally binding International Human Rights Treaty called the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The convention's 54 articles set out children's rights and how governments are required to ensure these rights meet children's basic needs and help them reach their full potential. Enumerated rights include the right to live, survive, and develop healthily, to have children's opinions expressed and taken seriously whenever decisions are being made that affects them, rights to information and to think for oneself, the right to be protected from violence, the right to health care and education, the right to fair, to fair treatment and dignity if accused of breaking the law, of not having to do dangerous work, and the right to enjoy one's own culture. I've posted a link to a child-friendly version of the UN Convention for all of us to look at and read in the remarks that I've posted to George Atherton that will be on our website. This UN Convention is a remarkable visionary document. But for the time being, let's focus now on Article 31 of the Convention. It states in part, quote, that every child has the right to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to the age of the child, and to participate freely in cultural life and the arts. Now, everything I've read and know by experience underlines that play is essential to the health and well-being of children and adults that it promotes creativity, imagination, and self-confidence, as well as physical, social, cognitive, and emotional strength and skills. It facilitates capacities to negotiate, to regain emotional balance, to resolve conflicts and make decisions. The main characteristics of play is that it's self-chosen and self-directed, that it's done for its own sake, with the means and activity of play as valued, if not more so, than the, the end results or outside rewards. Play has a loose structure and agreed upon rules. And finally, it's imaginative. You create your own worlds of make-believe where challenges are overcome or better worlds envisioned. Digging a bit deeper, crucially, Play includes the freedom to quit, which makes social play very democratic. Players want to keep the game going and so are motivated to make sure that others keep playing. That means paying attention to what others are saying and even to nonverbal expressions of happiness or unhappiness. In this way, social play helps children overcome narcissism and learn that they're not the center of the universe. We also know we often spend more time talking about how to play than actually playing in order to get needs and desires met while also helping others meet theirs. And finally, there's a special value to age-mixed play. When kids who differ widely in age and ability play together, the older ones, by necessity, boost the younger ones up to higher levels of activity. Whether it's outdoor games or playing cards, older kids will slow down a bit, not tackle so hard, or remind little ones to hold your cards up and pay attention. Cross-cultural research has shown that older kids who have regular contact with younger ones are generally kinder, not just to the younger children, but also to one another. 
I'll always remember the afternoon football games that all the kids, young and old, played in my neighborhood with dozens of us on each side. It could be rough. Sometimes we got hurt, but not too badly. And the big kids were always looking out for the little ones. It was so much fun. Anyway, in sum, play is how children learn to create their own activities, solve their own problems, take control of their own lives, get along with peers, overcome narcissism, and learn to deal with fear. Now, what does any of this have to do with the agonies, unrest, righteous anger, and protests of this past week? People in the United States and elsewhere, people of all ages, creeds, and color, cooped up by a pandemic, lives turned upside down by disease and economic distress, have, by the millions and tens of millions, been brought face to face to reckon with systemic graphic structures of white supremacy, racism, and militarized police violence in ways unthinkable just days and weeks before. And in response, have chosen to enter into a realm of self-directed, loosely structured, creative rules of the game made up ad hoc on the fly inclusive of widely different ages and walks of life. The purpose and point of all this, to pull down oppressive rules and domination of powers and structures of evil, and with one body, one act at a time, in concert with myriad protesting millions, to imaginatively envision a world transformed by righteous indignation love, and justice. The more I look, the more I listen and feel, this great upheaval has all the hallmarks of the essential human endeavor we call play. The ages-long human activity that is the foundation of our inventiveness, an engine for cultural innovation, and the creation of new worlds. The Latin root of our word play is plagian, to clap hands. And what is this? What's happening if not the explosive outburst of millions of hands clapping to wake us up, all of us, from centuries-long nightmares, to disenthrall us from privilege, supremacy, racism, violent policing, colonialism, I should be glad I've lived so long. One story, a true one. First, though, over 10,000 people were arrested in the United States protesting last week. However, in one major U.S. city, there have been no arrests of the tens of thousands of people of all ages who've been protesting the death of George Floyd and others. No arrests, no violence, no looting, no fires, no police in riot gear lined up to project intimidation. That city is Newark, the largest city in the state of New Jersey. In 1967, Newark endured one of the worst state-sponsored suppressions of rebellion against disenfranchisement and police brutality in U.S. history. 27 people were killed by police and National Guardsmen. Hundreds were wounded. City blocks were leveled by fires, and white residents and businesses fled in droves. From those traumatic events, an extraordinary thing happened. Those who remained, today half of Newark's residents are Afro-American, 36% are Hispanic, and 10% white. Those who remained through concerted grassroots efforts and elections peacefully seized the levers of municipal power, from school boards to housing authorities, from policing to city hall. Newark's had a succession now of boards, councils, 
policing and mayors who've come from the community, representing the community, a fact that's been crucial for Newark remaining violence-free during its own massive, passionate demonstrations this past week. More important than all, however, has been the decades-long efforts of local advocacy groups like the People's Organization for Progress, or POP, to prepare for this day, this time. Newark is a city of protest, said Larry Ham, the veteran leader of POP. And I want to um, quote him some at length. This is Larry Ham of the People's Organization for Progress. Pro Progress. We've been organizing actions against police brutality and the brutal savagery against oppressed communities for more than four decades, he said. A struggle for racial, social, and economic justice. So there's a lot of interaction between police and people in protest. We have a history. It's become routine. I wasn't overly concerned about last Saturday's protest because We've had a hundred dress rehearsals for this in Newark. The police are accustomed to us, and we have a city administration that has an official policy that is anti-police brutality. When asked what protesters in other places can learn from Newark, Mr. Ham said this, quote, they should continue to protest it's like practice in basketball or baseball. The more you do it, the more people of all ages and walks of life you include, the better you get at it. The more you protest, the more difficult it is for anyone to deny you the right. In fact, it's mentally unhealthy to repress that anger and that outrage. The difference is that we must take our outrage and take our anger and take our righteous indignation and turn it into energy to organize the people to fight against the forces of racism and oppression here in the United States. Now, I admit it was impressive to see local authorities and police in Newark embracing rallies, protest rallies this past week, supporting those protesting and condemning the death of George Floyd and police brutality. But what really stands out for me is the years and years of grassroots practice in building the capacities of young and old to negotiate, to keep emotional balance, to resolve conflicts and make decisions. The serious work of play paid off. And the people of Newark made their own rules. We will protest passionately, nonviolently. No one will be excluded, not even the police. And we will not see our city burn. In more than a dozen interviews this last week, protesters and city leaders said it was the potent determination of predominantly young African-American members of the Newark community deployed throughout the crowd who stood in the way of anyone intent on destruction. When you take it all in, no wonder, at one point in the demonstrations, protesters in Newark started dancing in the streets. Now, that's the power of play. And before, just before this service began, I went to the Newark News just to make sure. And the news is up to this day, and there have been protests in Newark all week long, there has not been one protest-related arrest. The police don't show up in riot gear and with shields. They join with protesters and demonstrators and there have been no arrests, no violence, no fires. There have been protests, marches, and dancing in the streets. And I want to underline for all of us that I think that's the power of play. 
the power of play both for children and for adults. People in Newark have been practicing it for decades. It's time we start practicing it here as well until we get really good at it. May this week and may the weeks become really begin to make a difference. And may it be so. Amen.